Hello, I'm Jeff Lutz, president of AOPA. Welcome to our COVID-19 town hall. I'm joined by Eve Lee, AOPA's executive director, Joe McTernan, AOPA's director of coding and reimbursement services, and Justin Bielan, director of government affairs. We know how all of you have been experiencing the massive impacts and heartbreak of COVID-19. But I also know that given our character and the strength of the P&O community, that when this is all said and done, we will recover. I've been impressed and very proud of the sharing of information and best practices amongst our membership. In the meantime, AOPA is here for you. We want to support you in any way we can. And in a few minutes, we're going to open it up to answer your questions. But first, I'm going to ask Eve to talk a little about what has been done to date. Eve? Thanks, Jeff. And I, too, want to welcome you today and to thank you for not only being here to ask your questions and share your experiences, but also to thank you for all you're doing for your companies, your employees, and your patients during this difficult time. AOPA has been hard at work doing everything we can to support you during this crisis. On the policy front, we have been working diligently with members of Congress and their staff to get items included in the COVID-19 relief packages that will offset some of the challenges you are facing. To help you navigate the myriad of emergency provisions coming out of CMS, such as the pausing of the prior authorization program, the suspension of most audit activities, and the expansion of the Medicare Accelerated and Advanced Payment Program, we have been regularly issuing OMP-specific guidance and have created a response and resources page on our website. We also have created a space on the co-op for members to share what they are doing to meet the challenges of this crisis with one another. We have provided free access to AOPAversity for all members and their employees for the rest of 2020. We will continue to do these things and more to help you get through this challenge of a lifetime. We very much welcome the opportunity to hear directly from you, either through a question posed today to one of our panelists, or anytime by calling or emailing us directly. We will now turn it over to you to hear what else we can be doing to support you during this time. Great, so our first question um, is related to some of the information you just provided, Eve. Where can we find information about COVID-19 resources? That's a great question, thanks, Ashley. Uh, and that's Ashley White, who will be asking the questions on, on your behalf. If you go to the AOPA website, which is www.aopanet.org, and if you look at the homepage, you'll see a, a line of tabs. And under resources, where Ashley is um, choosing right now, the first response, is, the first option is the COVID-19 response and resources page. And that's where you can find everything that we have done to date um, and all the gu issue guidance we have issued, um, all the webinars we have done, um, and all of the different resources that we have compiled um, related to COVID-19 that hopefully can help you get through, um, at, get any of your questions answered. Um, you can always uh, contact us directly at info at aopennet.org. Uh, the co-op at which Ashley has just put up on the screen is also a great resource um, for members that has a, a ton of information about state-specific um, response to, um, to the COVID crisis and um, also uh, a member-to-member -member sharing site where different members have logged on and, and posted different resources that they have used in their practices that they have found helpful that they have made available um, to the entire membership. Great. Our next question, uh, are ONP companies considered essential businesses? Yes, they absolutely are. Evidence through the CARES Act and the disbursements that CMS did in the past week. I think it's very important. We're here for our patients and we take care of essential care patients. In different states, there's some different guidance around what exactly is essential care. But I think we all agree, maintaining people's mobility and keeping them moving is essential for most patients when done safely. 
Great. The next question, um, Eve, this one's for you. How can I access AOPaversity? Uh, will my employees or I need a separate login? That's a great question. Thank you. Um, if you open, again, uh, the AOPanet.org, our website, under the Education tab, you'll find AOPaversity. I think it's the second option under the Education tab. And that will take you to the AOPaversity homepage. What you'll need is the your company's login information. So each AOPA member company has a separate login. And so you'll need that um, and make that available to your employees in order for them, yourself or them, to access AOPaversity. And as you can see on the screen, you'll see the um, different types of education that we offer. There is, um, I think, uh, upwards of 75 or 80 um, education um, opportunities within AOPaversity. Um, and so, and all of that will be made available for free for members um, with CE credits um, between now and the end of the year. Great, next question. Will the assembly be canceled? Also a good question. We're getting that question um, quite a bit and we want to, um, we're certainly very happy to be able to address that. We are very optimistic um, and hopeful that we, um, that this crisis will have subsided and we will be able to safely and um, uh, successfully host the assembly, which is September um, of 2020 in Las Vegas. Um, so for now, we are moving forward with the assembly. You will see registration open probably within the next few weeks. Um, and we will be very much monitoring the situation to see if any modifications, any changes need to be made. Um, the safety of our attendees is the most important um, guiding principle that we have and so we as of now we'll be hosting the assembly we'll be excited to welcome you to Las Vegas um, and we'll be monitoring things as they go that's a great question thank you great next question what is the status of Medicare audits during the COVID-19 public health emergency so I can take that one um, Medicare audits for all intents and purposes right now have been essentially suspended uh, as a result of the COVID-19 uh, public health emergency. Uh, this includes CERT audits, this includes TPE audits, which are target probe educate audits that are done at the DME MAC level. This includes supplemental, supplemental medical review contractor audits, uh, as well as both automated and complex reviews done by the RAC contractors. Uh, the only exception to this right now that we are aware of is that CMS and the DME Max do reserve the right to audit providers where there is a bona fide um, suspicion of actual fraud and abuse. So if there is a suspicion of fraud and abuse, uh, they will and they can continue to audit specific providers uh, as part of that investigative process. But in general, uh, as a result of the PHE, uh, audits have been suspended, at least temporarily. Okay. We have some related questions, um, and so I'm gonna pull a few in from um, our question section here. Um, when billing for prosthetic services to Medicare right now, if normal doc documentation from the physicians is not available, what modifier should be used? Sure, so that's a really, really good question. Um, the only specific emergency-related modifier that we are aware of is what's called the CR modifier, and the CR modifier is only to be used uh, when you are specifically uh, applying a what's called an 1135 waiver, which is a blanket waiver that is used whenever there is a declaration of a national emergency. Uh, so the modifier that should or can be used in these scenarios uh, when there is a question on audits, or not audits, on, on documentation, I'm sorry. Um, however, CMS and the DME Max have all acknowledged that there are situations where it may not be possible to get the same level of documentation that you're expected to or used to getting uh, previously because of the situation. They have made statements on certain things like proof of delivery requirements, uh, signatures on advanced beneficiary notices. Uh, those have both been addressed very specifically saying that if you are unable to get those signatures, uh, just clearly document uh, the situation uh, and you should be fine. Um, there are other scenarios where they are still awaiting guidance. Uh, the DME Max are awaiting a lot of guidance from CMS directly on how to handle these individual situations. We are asking these questions as quickly as we can, uh, seeking clarification as well. 
for now, it's, uh, the best thing you can do is make sure that you are documenting in your own record why and if you are unable to obtain the documentation that you normally would be able to get um, and make sure that is well documented in your records. And again, this is unique times. Um, there are uh, exceptions that are being made every single day. And as soon as we can confirm specific exceptions and exemptions, uh, we will be sure to communicate those. Great. Um, there is a question about uh, taking precautions uh, when sending casts to fabrication. Yeah, I, I so think I, common. Uh, go ahead, Joe. I'm sorry. I, I, I was I was just gonna gonna say that I mean there's there's very specific. Um, guidance regarding disease control and CDC guidance on um, on controlling uh, infectious disease uh, transmission. I think that would be a good place to start as far as making sure that that guidance is being very closely followed uh, to make sure that there is not risk of uh, accidental transmission of the virus uh, through the shipment of cast, cast materials, molds, models, etc. Uh, and Jeff, please feel free to add. I didn't. I didn't mean to step step in your way there. No, not at all. But disinfecting casts is should be uh, common sense applied as they're packed. Uh, we, we use gloves when we're packing and just try to keep people on the other receiving end safe. Same thing as receiving and disinfecting things as they're received prior to being applied to patients. So we have a follow-up question to your um, 1135 waiver um, question, uh, waiver answer. Does this only apply to the replacement of items as a direct result of misplacement due to COVID-19? So the loss uh, in ambulance was the example that was provided. Does it only apply? So that, that's a very good question and one that we unfortunately uh, did receive clarification on. We were not terribly uh happy about the answer because it, it is a little bit inflexible but as it was explained to us uh 1135 waivers are very very specific in nature and they have to be directly related to whatever emergency has been declared in order to be applied on a blanket basis so we actually asked this very question on a dme mac uh open open door call not too long ago um, and we were told that, unfortunately, the way the waivers are structured, um, you cannot use the 1135 waiver to justify replacement of any item of Demipos without a physician order, um, simply because the patient was not able to get to their physician or was not able to get somewhere to get the documentation that supports the medical need for replacement. The example they gave us specifically was that if a patient is being transported to the hospital to be treated for COVID-19 related symptoms uh, and they lose their brace in the ambulance while being transported, then that is a very specific situation where the 1135 waiver would apply. You would bill for the replacement without needing a new order, without needing new documentation, uh, and you could um, apply the CR modifier in that case to bring the 1135 waiver into play. Um, that being said, they also acknowledge times and that there is probably some uh, some relaxation of the rules of the requirements that may be coming, but it unfortunately cannot be done through the 1135 waiver process. So the need for the lot the loss or the need for the replacement uh, would have to be directly related to a COVID-19 situation loss or damage uh, situation. And Joe, what items are needed when, uh, I think documentation items are needed when mailing out uh, deliveries if patients don't want to come into the office? So again, in, in that scenario, and I'm sorry for, for, for <laughs> answering all the questions here, uh, but, but in that situation, um, again, I think it all comes down to your documentation. Um, you know, there is, uh, there is a whole, if it's orthosis related, orthotic related, um, there is a whole series of custom fit versus off-the-shelf codes um, where this may be a scenario where if you are mailing an item out to a patient uh, and you have to make a decision between off-the-shelf 
uh, and custom fitted, and you have you have not been able to necessarily modify that orthosis. Uh, that may be a, a good justified reason to build the OTS code in that scenario. Um, in situations where you're mailing, uh, make sure everything is documented that you are doing, that you are doing to modify, that you have consulted with the patient, with the physician, to make sure that that delivery is working for that patient. Uh, if you can then um, make sure that that patient is using that device, it's fine. Um, uh, as a follow-up, and that documentation on a follow-up basis is going to be helpful as well. So. Joe, one more here. Related to um, the audit question, will CMS be able to audit claims remedially after the crisis ends? So, yeah, another really good question. They have they have said that they are pausing audits for the moment. That they might uh, that they might and can go back after the fact and audit. But if they're going to do that, um, they would have to have certain criteria in play. I can't. I would be very surprised if they are going to audit um, based on stringent documentation requirements after the fact um, when there is a national health emergency going on. So um, this is a follow-up question about the documentation piece. Um, it, it, it seems that many are having trouble, difficulty getting physicians' notes at this time, um, and those are required in some policies. Um, since ONP notes have legal standing, um, is there has there been any other guidance around um, obtaining physician notes? Is there any additional guidance we can provide? Um, the only guidance that we can provide right now, and I'm sorry, this is not a better answer, is that the DME Max are aware that this is an issue. Um, they are honestly awaiting guidance themselves uh, from CMS. So um, we've asked the question, we've asked the question repeatedly along with every other provider group that's out there. Uh, you guys are not alone in the struggle with this by, by any means. Um, but there's a lot of questions about this. The DME Max have been very, very careful while they've been as flexible as they can be, uh, and they've been very transparent and communicative. Uh, there are certain times where they have simply had to say, we are simply awaiting further guidance from CMS. So um, as this develops, as we get more clarification, we will be sure to communicate it through the resources that AOP has put out there on our website, through the co-op. Um, our goal is at AOPA is to try and be as communicative and as timely with our communications as possible. Um, so as soon as we get any further clarification, we'll be sure to share that, absolutely. Great. One more for you, Joe. Is it true that Medicare has delayed the implementation of Medicare prior authorization for the six lower limb prosthesis codes uh, previously announced? Well, that's one I can answer definitively. Um, yes, they have. So this was announced last week. Uh, prior authorization for the six lower limb prosthesis codes uh, that was scheduled to go into effect in four states in May and then nationwide in October uh, has been put on hold uh, and will be implemented at a later time once the um, public health emergency is over and things have returned back to what, what we would all consider normal. Um, they have also uh, delayed the further implementation or they've delayed continued implementation of prior authorization for the rest of DMEPOS, for the rest of DME, which is uh, power mobility devices and pressure reducing surfaces. Um, one little unique caveat there is because that program has been ongoing, uh, they are still making it available to folks as a voluntary program. If folks for those other categories want to submit uh, claims, they will still be reviewed. Um, but nobody will be held or nobody will have a claim denied uh, because a prior authorization was not affirmed. So we did ask the question as to whether that uh, that voluntary system would be eligible or available to ONP, and the answer there was that because the program was not implemented, uh, that, that that is not an option. So for now, it is business as usual. Prior authorization will be implemented down the road. Uh, but not in May, and, uh, and 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 I would imagine not nationally in October. I think everything will be pushed uh, kind of kind of along both both ways. Great, uh, Justin. We've got one for you. Does my business have to qualify as a small business 
concern as defined in Section 3 of the Small Business Act um, of the U.S. Code in order to participate in the PPP? That's, uh, the long that's, a, good, that's a good question. So uh, the Paycheck Protection Act, which was just passed as part of the CARES Act, uh, you know, those loans flow through the Small Business Administration. Uh, but no, uh, in addition to small business concerns, uh, uh, business is eligible for a, uh, a PPP loan if the business has 500 or fewer employees uh, whose principal place of residence is the United States, uh, or if your business meets the SBA employee Bayside standards for the industry uh, in which it operates, uh, if that's applicable to you. Um, there are also loans available through this program for tax exempt uh, 501c3s uh, for veteran owned organizations. Um, so uh, short answer to your question is no. Okay. Another question for you. The CARES Act excludes from the definition of payroll costs any employee compensation in excess of an annual salary of $100,000. Does that exclusion apply to all employee benefits of monetary value? Uh, no, uh, that's a great question. So uh, there's been a lot of questions coming in email about that is uh, that $100,000 salary threshold. So the exclusion of compensation in excess of $100,000 uh, applies only to cash compensation, uh, not to non-cash benefits. Uh, so your employer contributions to the retirement plan is not included in that. Uh, if you do health care coverage, uh, that's not included in that. And then any payment of state and local taxes uh, assessed on the compensation of your employees is not included in that. So it's just base salary uh, is how they, they figure that number. Okay, great. We've got some more questions related to this. So I'm going to, um, to, to go through those now. There was a, a question here. Um, we sent out a, a communication on Friday uh, saying you should all check your bank accounts. Um, can you provide a little more information? It looks like um, that one wasn't fully finished, but um, this was regarding certain healthcare providers, um, including OMP. Could we explain that loan? How did that work? What was that? Um, is it forgivable? Uh, I, the stimulus check is the is is the question. Sure, uh, and I would emphasize strongly that it is not a loan. You are not expected to pay that back. So. Uh, as part of the CARES Act, uh, there was something created called the CARES Act Provider Relief Fund, and this is $100 billion uh, that is intended to go to hospitals and other healthcare providers on the front lines uh, of the coronavirus response. In other words, essential employees, as Jeff said at the, at the outset. Um, to be frank, we were not sure that we were going to be included in that. Uh, we had lobbied very hard to make sure that we were included in that and that uh, both Congress and the administration recognized uh, that our work was not stopping as a result of COVID-19. Um, without being told as such, apparently we were successful as a lot of folks are getting uh, the first cut of this $100 billion uh, in the Provider Relief Fund. That first cut is $30 billion. Uh, it was intended to go immediately directly to frontline uh, healthcare workers. Uh, and these are, again, payments. These are not loans, and these do not need to be repaid. Um, anyone, any facility, any provider that did Medicare fee-for-service in 2019 are eligible for the distribution. Um, if that is you, uh, hopefully you got yours on Friday. There are some more going through Monday and today, uh, Monday and tomorrow, sorry, today and tomorrow. Um, there are also, if you don't do uh, direct deposit or EFT through with CMS, uh, you'll get paper checks in the mail. Um, but conceivably, again, anyone that does Medicare fee-for-service uh, is entitled to that money. Um, there are very, very small caveats with that. Uh, it's not expected to be paid back, but you do have to go to the HHS website um, in the email that we sent. And if you didn't get that, please reach out to us and we can, we can send you the, the terms. But basically, it basically has to say that I'm using this to cover expenses. I'm using this to keep my business afloat. Um, and it's very easy to, uh, to, to prove that, that that's the case. Uh, the other thing that is a little strange is they're uh, asking, to, uh, asking for you to say that your business has uh, worked with patients who uh, either had or are suspected to have had uh, um, some sort of uh, related to COVID. In other words, um, you, possibly people who might have been touched by this disease, that's impossible to prove. Um, and it's also impossible for them to check on. So essentially, if you're open for business, anyone right now could be a carrier of this disease, as we all know. Um, so they're not looking for like a specific person or specific proof on that. They just want to say, okay, my doors are open. And as a result of that, I'm probably uh, exposing myself, uh, 
in as much as I'm avoiding it, I'm, I'm, I could be exposing myself and my staff to people who have COVID. Uh, obviously, again, that's fairly unprovable, um, but the fact that your doors are open is enough going to be enough proof for uh, HHS. Um, and so again, the actual, the portal where you can go to do that affirmation is actually not open yet. It's supposed to be open uh, either today or tomorrow. Um, but again, this is not a loan. This is a, a direct payment to you. So you um, answered, mostly answered that question. We have several of the same questions, similar questions coming in. Um, sure. And so um, we want to have it clarified. Um, it, so so a couple of things. Um, we've got some follow-ups here. Um, sure. For that last answer, um, it's up to $100,000 of their compensation plus health insurance and retirement 401k. Um, that that was for the um, one the question that you answered previously. Yes. Yeah, so that is not part of the uh, that $30 billion. That's part of the CARES Act money. Right. Um, and also a question about the the. I think they're referring to this as Sorry. the CMS grants, but it's actually the um, payment that you just referred to, which is not a grant. I mean, it is a grant and not a loan. Um, right. That one. Right. That one does have the contact information that you were just talking about um, for those who did not receive a disbursement. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. So two different things, just to clarify. So there's. The money that's available uh, in the PPP, the Paycheck Protection, Pro Protection Program, through the Small Business Administration, um, and that you would have to actively apply for uh, through your local banks and get that um, taken care of. The CARES Act provider relief fund, out of the same legislation, of course, but that is going directly into your bank account. You don't have to apply for that. I don't know if that answers the question, actually. It, well, it does. I think um, I think that people generally are um, confused about the different buckets of money. So I think you've helped provide some clarification here. Um, and I hope that if your question wasn't answered, um, please re, um, resend a question if I didn't ask it appropriately. Um, OK, for those disbursements, it looks like several people that are at in attendance have not received those um, from okay. the grant. Um, so they, there are a lot of questions about um, what they should do. Uh, so if you haven't gotten one yet, I would not uh, panic at this point. Uh, again, these are uh, there's uh, $30 billion being distributed, and it's going to take some time to get that uh, through the machine uh, of, of, of bureaucracy. Uh, but a lot of them went through Friday. Some of them are coming through today, and some of them are scheduled to go through again tomorrow. Uh, if by Tuesday you haven't got one, I would encourage you to reach out to me uh, at AOPA, and I will uh, we'll try to dig into what's going on. Um, this is not certainly not going to be a perfect system. This was put together basically starting last Wednesday and it was rolled out on Friday, uh, which for the government is pretty impressive. And so there's probably going to be some cracks in the system, but we'll work with you to make sure that we're addressing uh, your issue if you should be getting some of this funding. And Justin, you just referenced um, a form that will that isn't ready yet, but you expect that it will be um, posted soon. Can you um, describe and explain that a little bit more? Sure. So this is if you go to uh, and you can reach out to us if you don't uh, aren't able to write this down. But if you just go to hhs.gov slash provider hyphen relief. Again, that's hhs.gov slash provider hyphen relief. Um, you'll see the CARES Provider Relief Fund. There's a huge description on what it is uh, and who's eligible for it, how the payments uh, to you were uh, your payment distributions were determined, uh, how, to de how to determine if you are in fact an eligible provider, which again is pretty simple in our case. Um, and that of course this is different from the uh, CMS Accelerated Advanced Payment Program. Um, on that page, uh, if you've gotten one of these disbursements, whether you got it Friday or today or tomorrow, um, there will, again, there is not now, but there will be uh, a way for you to attest to the fact that you're using this to keep your business afloat. Um, there are terms and conditions that you have to meet, but uh, it's 30 pages and they're very in-depth. Some of them have no relation to what we do at all. Um, but basically, you know, all you have to go in is, is just say, do you agree to these rules, which is that I'm using this to keep my business afloat, and that's all you have to do. Um, there won't be a lot to it, we're told. And related to those payments, um, is that based on fiscal year 19 Medicare payments or billed amounts? Uh, I believe that is payments. Um, again, that page that I just referenced will give you all of the, the lowdown on that for sure, but I am pretty sure it's payments. Great, thank you. 
um, lots of um, lots of questions coming in um, related right. to this. So we're gonna keep them coming. Um, they Please. were told that the fund is being a, a administered by Optum. Is this correct? That is correct. Okay. Um, It says, we are a small OMP business with 13 employees. As a healthcare provider, we are exempt from honoring paid leave for staff members with otherwise eligible reasons for filing for paid family leave, are we? I'm sorry, Ashley, could you repeat that one? Yes, I'll read it again. Uh, we are a small ONP business with 13 employees. As a healthcare provider, are we exempt from honoring paid leave for staff members with otherwise eligible reasons for filing for paid family leave? I believe the answer is yes. I want to emphasize that uh, I, I will speak for myself. I'm not a lawyer and I'm not a tax attorney, so I don't want to give negative advice uh, for specific examples like this. But as I read the rules of this, uh, given the size of your organization, that yes, you would be exempt. Another follow-up question. So um, you referenced the form and the place that people will have to provide a report to HHS about how those funds were being used. That will be a requirement. Is that correct? That is a requirement. And report is a strong word. Again, it'll probably just be you signing a piece of or assigning a, a digital form. Uh, but yes, you will have to agree to those, agree to uh, accept the disbursement of those funds under um, the parameters that they provide. Um, but again, you'll see the terms and conditions on that page that I mentioned, uh, and there is no one on this call who won't be uh, able to fulfill those. In addition to the PPP loans and the CMS grants, are there other funds available? So the first 30 billion of that, uh, the provider program has been released. Uh, we are in the process of working with CMS to try to find out how our members might be able to access the additional 70, million, 70 billion. Um, so there will be more money available there. Uh, that's A. B, uh, Congress is, as we speak, working on expanding the Paycheck Protection Program. So we'll to allow, uh, not only put more money into the program because it is rapidly being used up, um, but try to expand the reach of who is able to access that money and the, the parameters under which they're able to access it. That's B. And then C, Congress is already working on the next coronavirus package. Um, we're in the early stages of that, but it is uh, fairly certain there will be more money available uh, in various programs for that. So I think the PPP will be the big one that comes out of this, and that's the that's what uh, Congress is using for businesses to stay afloat. There's a whole bunch of other uh, tax incentives for individuals, including expanded unemployment uh, and things like that, to stay uh, on their feet. Um, but for now, the main thing is the PPP and that disbursement. But there is things are happening very fast in DC, and so. I expect there will be more and you'll hear about them from us as they happen. In terms of the reporting um, that you just explained, um, that those guidelines and the um, exclusions and all of the information about that, that will be available on the HHS website. Um, the, it, That's correct. Those quarterly, those quarterly reporting requirements will also be outlined there? That's correct. And again, um, and this is all because this is, I'm sorry, actually, because this is also new, a lot of this is still being written and some of the guidance on this is still being finalized. Um, so we're kind of, uh, we're kind of operating in real time here. So uh, it, it'll be available, but it might not be available yet. Is there a uniform standard that the individual banks must maintain for loan distribution um, for those PPP loans? Not at all. Uh, in fact, there is huge, uh, um, a huge amount of leeway that the SBA is giving to those banks in terms of the disbursement of those loans. And the, the onus of uh, illustrating the need for those loans and uh, the onus of proving uh, how you're using that loan money is really all on uh, the individual business. It's not um, on the bank. Uh, so the banks are given a lot of leeway just to work with uh, the people that they're lending to to make sure that uh, this is all working. So most of the onus for all of this is on the business owner and not some bureaucracy that's trying to monitor all of this. Great. Joe, I've got one for you. Um, can we expect competitive bidding to be delayed? Um, so that's a really good question, and I think it's one that's just a little bit too soon to really have a a, a good crystal ball answer. Um, I know that uh, there's concern about competitive bidding, and 
how it may be impacted by access issues in the community uh, for providers. Uh, what I can say is that CMS has actually already taken, taken action uh, in one product category that's scheduled for implementation uh, in January of 2021, and that is non-invasive ventilators. Um, obviously, with things like ventilators, uh, there is a critical need for those type, that type of equipment right now today that could be seriously impacted in a, in a competitive bidding environment. So CMS last week uh, did take action. They did remove non-invasive ventilators as a product category from competitive bidding. Um, they have not as of yet removed any other product categories, nor have they suspended uh, competitive bidding 2021 from going into effect uh, in January. So we are watching that closely. We are in communication with both CMS um, and the CBIC. We are participating in regular industry stakeholder calls where, where competitive bidding is definitely a topic of discussion. Uh, and we will continue to address that uh, as we move th forward through this situation. Um, but but right now it, it's it's you know it's it's eight nine months away from implementation, and there's still a lot of uncertainty about where where healthcare will be, uh, where the community will be at that point. Uh, we're watching it closely, but as of right now, it has not been definitively suspended. No. Um, related to the the 70 billion remaining, and I know this is going to be an open-ended question, and you referenced it already um, somewhat, Justin. Um, can OMP expected to receive more grants out of that money? Is that a, a, an expectation coming out of the 70 billion? Yes, for sure. Those uh, that additional 70 billion is not uh, also like the first 30 billion, not going to be loans. That's all going to be grants, and so it's uh, a little unclear as to how they're going to determine who gets that. Um, in the next round, uh, but again, we're, we're fighting hard with Congress and the administration to make sure that uh, folks that didn't get it for whatever reason in the first round, whether they be manufacturers or however else, um, that they're uh, included in, or at least considered in the, in the second round. So, but those will all be grants again. This is, uh, this is money that CMS wants to inject back into the healthcare industry. Sure. Great. Thank you, Justin. There's so many questions coming in. I just thank, thank you so much, everyone, for, for keeping these questions flowing. Um, can you reflect on the accelerated payments that are not related to these grant funds? So uh, Medicare uh, advanced payments and other payments like that. So I, I'm, I'm happy to take that one. So uh, one of the things that, that CMS has offered is uh, a expansion of what's called the accelerated and advanced payment program. This is a program that exists, that has existed for many, many years. Uh, to address uh, cash flow situations uh, caused by national emergencies. Um, you've probably never heard of it because it was never anything in previous emergencies that really was applicable to O&P per se. But they, as a result of COVID-19, uh, CMS has expanded this program, significantly reduced the regulatory hurdles that are in place uh, that would not allow it. So Medicare advanced payments, are available. Uh, AOPA participated on a, again, another uh, webinar last week with the DME Max to discuss that and to hear more about that. Um, essentially, these are uh, just what they say they are. They are advanced Medicare payments that you can ask for. You, The DME Max have seven days to process these requests. Uh, and essentially, you can submit for up to three months of uh, payments in advance where they will take your previous three month Medicare billing payment history, reimbursement history, and they will issue those payments to you in advance. Uh, without going into an hour's worth of details, essentially you have 120 days, um, 120, yep, it's 120 days uh, before repayment begins on, on these advance payments. And all of the advance payments must be paid back within 210 days. Uh, so you can uh, you can apply for up to 100% of those advance payments, which again would represent the previous three months of Medicare payments. Um, and then after 120 days, and you can still con continue to submit claims to Medicare uh, during the 120 days and be reimbursed for those claims. 
um, at 120 days, Medicare will start recouping that money back uh, and offsetting future payments against the advance payments until that full balance is paid back. One of the questions that came back was, what if 210 days pass and the full advance payment balance is not paid back? Um, they didn't really have an answer for that. What they said was that they set it up the way they did so that 210 days of payback period should be more than enough to cover 120 days of, of payment. Um, so they don't expect that to be an issue, but that is how that program will work. Uh, it is not a loan. Uh, it is not uh, anything like that. It is simply an advance payment that will then be offset by future claims, uh, just so you are aware, uh, it is offset at 100%, meaning that Medicare will not pay you anything until any amount that you collected as an advance payment is recouped uh, through those payments on future claims. So I hope that answers that question. Yeah, that's great, Joe, thank you. Um, switching back a little bit to um, the documentation questions we had earlier, um, this question is specifically about documentation that's obtained as a result of telemedicine. So I'm combining a few people's questions here. Um, and I know there's a couple of things we need to consider. Um, obviously, face-to-face -face requirements that are statutory still need to be um, maintained. But this question is specifically about prostheses. Sure. So, so what, what CMS and what the DME, DME Max have said is that uh, documentation that is obtained through a qualifying telehealth visit uh, with a physician uh, is acceptable during the COVID-19 crisis. The bigger issue is that they have significantly relaxed uh, the qualifying elements of a, what, what accounts and what constitutes a covered telehealth visit. So in the past, while telehealth was an option, uh, it was fairly restrictive in that a patient had to go to a designated telehealth center. Communication had to be two-way through video on, over a secure network. Uh, there were a lot of hurdles to cross uh, in order for telehealth to be considered a viable option. Uh, as a result of the public health emergency, they have essentially relaxed everything that they possibly can to the point where you can now basically have a telehealth visit uh, through things like FaceTime. Um, where that was not an option in the past. So uh, what we are, what we know for a fact is that telehealth documentation that meets Medicare's requirements um, is valid to support your claims. Um, there is a, a lot of questions that we get about whether O&P can provide telehealth visits. Um, that brings into play some of the face-to-face -face, uh, statutory requirements. Right now, the only thing that we know of that we can really say is still a requirement because of statute uh, is the requirements for diabetic shoes. Uh, diabetic shoes statutorily require a face-to-face -face visit with the prescribing and the certifying physician within time frames prior to delivery of the shoes. Uh, and they also require a face-to-face -face visit uh, for evaluation and at time of delivery uh, with the provider. In this case, it would most likely be the orthotist or the podorthist. Um, in order to qualify for Medicare coverage. Uh, we did in one of the webinars we participated, we did confirm that again, they have asked for further clarification from CMS, but until they receive any clarification, the DME Max do have to follow existing policy requirements, which for diabetic shoes do include those face-to-face -face visit requirements. So um, that unfortunately is the one area where there has not been a, a significant relaxation of the requirements. but. Uh, but yes, telehealth documentation, as long as it meets the, 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 the criteria for coverage under Medicare, is valid as a form of documentation. Great. And there's a few um, follow-up questions here on the SBA loans. And I just wanted to mention that we did do um, an SBA loan um, webinar, and that is available on that resources page that we referenced earlier. So. Um, there are a lots of lot of those SBA questions were answered on that on that webinar previously. Just wanted to mention that as a resource. Um, I've got an interesting question here um, and uh, an answer we can provide. As our industry organization, are you maintaining any database of how much our industry is being impacted and how many practitioners are being laid off due to COVID-19? Um, Eve, I, I figured you want to mention the survey that's coming up here. 
Absolutely. Um, so we will be sending out a survey um, that will kind of just get at those questions, um, both on the manufacturer side and on the patient care side, so that we can kind of collect that information, also push it back out to members so you can see how others, um, how this is impacting the, the entire profession. Um, we will be working with um, other organizations within our field to, to match and see what data they're collecting that um, we could maybe compile with ours. Um, but th that isn't something that we've done yet, but we will be fielding that survey. I think it's going out this week. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to share um, some of what we find within the next um, few weeks. One more question about SBA loans here, Justin. Um, we are a small OMP shop. Is the SBA disaster loan assistance something we can look into, should look into? If so, is it 100% forgivable if we check the box stating we want the 10K advance and decline any loans? Yes, provided you're using it for uh, the costs that they encourage that you use it for, which is to keep your employees employed and uh, and working through through this time. But yes, absolutely. And I would I should add that those you know those uh, contingencies are very loose. In other words, as long as you're using the money in some way to keep your doors open, um, they're going to be pretty forgiving in terms of uh, not needing to pay that back. Great, thank you, Justin. Um, we have a few questions related to PPE, um, and so I thought I would ask Eve just to um, talk a little bit about um, the data we're collecting on PPE and uh, availability of PPE for O&P providers. So um, we don't have um, that data, like I said, now we will be fielding that survey. Um, I think that we, and we don't have um, any coalitions or any um, organizations that we're working with directly to help source um, our members with more PPE. I think it's something we can definitely explore um, as we move forward through this crisis. Um, uh, and we can definitely see if there are avenues that we can assist our members in terms of, of making sure they have enough PPE to continue to see patients safely. That's great. Okay, so we are, um, I think we've got everyone's questions answered. If I missed your question, I'm so sorry. I think I, I went back and got them. I tried to lump them in as related topics um, with everyone. Um, oh, here we go. Another one has just come up. Does, mo does most liability insurance cover us as practitioners? I'm, I'm assuming that means if you, if you get COVID-19. So I if think you I will get or oh, if you give. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would think the if the question is do you have liability for maybe transmitting COVID nineteen, right. I would check with your carrier, but I think it'd be of utmost importance that you're using universal precautions per the C D C I think would definitely go a long ways in making sure you're isolated from those liabilities. And related to that question, um, this one is uh, whether or not employers are liable if an employee gets infected. Well, as, as essential providers, which we are essential healthcare providers, there is always at risk. Uh, one of the things I think all of us need to do is put it in perspective with the precautions and the PPE that we have that some other uh, professions, i.e. the grocery store, other essential businesses don't have as much access to. I think we need to be safe, careful, kind, and that is always a risk that we run being frontline medical providers in essential care. There's also a question about loss of revenue or business um, and insurance carriers uh, covering that loss of revenue. Um, and we obviously don't have an insurance carrier represented here on the on the call, but does anyone have um, any thoughts on uh, can companies claim loss of revenue? 
So my understanding, um, we've gotten that question a few different times, and I think um, it does really, you have to um, talk with your carrier about what is covered under your policy, um, because it does vary. So I think that that's, that's the answer we've been given, um, and happy to kind of talk offline if there's a way we connect to, with um, other resources as well. Ah, this is a, a good one, um, Joe. So as long as we put a sign up, are we okay with closing early, um, starting late, depending on patients' needs due to COVID-19 uh, changes of schedule? So uh, typically in a, in a non-emergency environment, uh, that would actually not be allowed by supplier standards because supplier standards say that you have uh, you must have posted hours of operation and that you must be open during your posted hours of operation. Um, but the uh, National Supplier Clearinghouse um, has basically not only suspended um, uh, many of their accreditation requirements during the public health emergency, uh, many of their revalidation requirements, uh, but they have essentially stopped site visits right now. Um, so even if there was an enforcement action there, which I do not believe there would not be some significant leeway on those actions, um, even if there was uh, an enforceable action there, uh, frankly, I don't think there's any inspector that's going to come out uh, to harass you about uh, having a temporary sign on your door because you've had a close for an hour or two because of a of, of a of an emergency situation. So. Um, in the grand scheme of things, I think there are probably a lot more things to be worried about and be concerned about, and I'm not belittling it at all, uh, but I just don't think it's anything that's going to necessarily get somebody in a whole heap of trouble. Now, if you're going to if you're going to close down an office so that you can consolidate operations uh, in the public health emergency, then that's something that you probably want to notify the NSC about uh, and update your provider file. But I don't think there's really any uh, any huge risk at a temporary closure uh, and a, 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 a short-term sign on a door saying, you know, we'll be back at X, X time or tomorrow or whatnot. I, I can't imagine that there's, that there's a, a whole uh, case for, for major enforcement on those type of things right now. Ashley, can I can I just I know it's not a question, but can I share one thing that that I was uh, I was hoping that I would get a question on because it's good news. Um, uh, one of the things that we have confirmed is that as part of the effort to provide some provider relief, um, they CMS and Medicare has suspended sequestration based reductions uh, for the remainder of 2020. So. Uh, we have been in a sequestration environment for going on eight or nine years now where reimbursements were reduced by 2%. As a result of that, uh, that 2% per claim uh, reimbursement reduction has been eliminated uh, until December, uh, until the end of December 2020. So for the remainder of the year, uh, that 2% reduction should no longer be appearing uh, on your claim remittances, and you should be getting the full reimbursement according to the your fee schedule. So, just just a little bit of good news to share. Great. Um, Want to offer some clarification on an earlier comment? Um, Jeff shared a, a bit um, on the question about person-to-person -person transmission, um, but companies that have person-to-person -person transmission are not liable, um, generally speaking. So, just wanted to clarify that um, for those who who follow it up with us on that. Um, we also have a question here, or actually um, a comment here that is relevant um, that says workers' comp may also cover employees who get the virus at work. Um, it's a may, um, and that was provided to us by uh, an insurance carrier. So just wanted to um, to add that to, to that answer. Justin, you had mentioned um, additional loan grant resources to veterans. Can you elaborate um, on the veteran piece? Uh, so they're not in a, they're not uh, additional. They're uh, the ones that already exist. So the, the 30 billion, uh, both the 30 billion and uh, the the PPP carves out uh, specific um, 
paths towards the funding for uh, veteran organizations or organizations that service veterans. So it's the same pool of funding. It's just um, uh, there are more ways to access or easier ways to access it. Um, and I can uh, send along information or you can find that on, on HHS's webpage about uh, the SBA loans as well. But there's not additional funding. I should make that clear. Great. Thank you, Justin. Um, for those of you who joined a little late, um, yes, this is being recorded. So I had a couple of people ask if this is being recorded and it will be provided um, following following the um, conclusion. Uh, uh, interesting question here about licensure. Can a licensed practitioner in one state provide services in another state because of COVID-19? Are there relaxed rules around licensure? So, uh, Jeff, you're on mute. My apologies. I, I think that would be a state-specific question because licensure isn't federal, so different states are going to have different rules. I think uh, patient access and care is front and foremost in most, in all state governments now. So I would call the licensing board in that state and just for your own protection, get it get it in writing that it's allowable and we have seen um, just as a follow-up to that some um, specific licensure relaxations texas has um, some information that's passed recently um, and we'll be adding those to the state pages of the co-op okay well we have um, come to the end of the questions in our list um really really engaging questions oh one one more i'm oh, sorry go ahead justin i was just gonna make a request of everybody who's uh, watching if you've got um uh you know if you're if you're telling if you've got the stories of the folks that you're treating right now if you have pictures of uh your employees at work if you have uh you know any any stories or photos of you have of your team doing the job and keeping uh keeping our industry going during these times please do send them to aopa uh it's very important that we show all of this to the hill um you know the capitol hill and and and, and politicians have always had uh a bit of a, a they don't really understand what it is that we do and the importance of it especially in a time like this so the more uh, especially visual evidence that we can provide the better so please if you've got uh, pictures that you're taking of you working with your patients in or out of a hospital setting please do share those with us so that we can uh, you work with the hill to and get those to the hill and get your story told i would be very appreciative well i want to thank you for joining us today and sharing your experiences with the issues we're facing and your insightful questions the aopa board and staff will review the issues raised and help development develop additional resources where appropriate we'll continue to provide guidance and resources during this whole covid experience please stay tuned for details about our virtual policy form that'll take place may 6 Despite not being able to be together in Washington, D.C., we can still raise our voices for the profession and the patients we serve. Thank you all for joining again. Please stay safe, kind, and well. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Safe, everyone. Be healthy.